Greetings citizens. Hey you, hey you beautiful creepy human being you. Welcome to my channel and welcome to today's true crime video. I'm so happy we could meet like this. I'm so happy that somehow in all of this that we're forced to go through on the daily, today you and I were able to find each other on this crazy little planet that we call home. My name is Brittany or Bratterstein, whichever you prefer, and today we're going to be discussing the absolutely senseless murder of 16-year-old Mickey Costanzo. But before we get started, if you have not yet had the pleasure, please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell. I put out a new video every single week, and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you, specifically you, but I can only do that if you join the Brat Pack and become one of us. One of us, one of us, one of us. And you can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. They're all Bratterstein, but no pressure. Now, before we get into the story, I need to say a quick thank you to the sponsor of today's video, which is Dossier. Dossier is one of my sponsors that makes it possible for me to make videos like this as consistently as I do. Now, if you are not familiar with Dossier, if you just wait a second, you're about to get familiar with Dossier. Dossier is a fragrance company that creates luxury scents, but a fraction of the luxury price tag, where most luxury perfumes can cost anywhere from 50 to hundreds of dollars. How dare they? Dossier's perfumes only range from $29 to $49, and, and they offer bulk deals with up to 25% off and also free shipping when you buy three or more bottles, which is a deal that sounds too good to be true. I know. I hear it. I'm like, but is that the truth? It is. This is real life. This is Dossier. <laughs> now the first scent I got that I wanna share with you today is called, oh my God, it's called Woody Raspberry. It's inspired by the perfume Lady Million. And oh my God, this is a scent that I had never tried before. It's a new one. I decided to, you know, branch out, dip my toes in the pool of possibility, right? And oh my gosh, I wish I had gotten it sooner. It smells like sweet, but not too sweet, you know, like an adult sweet. And I am really excited to wear it. And I wish I got it sooner because this might be one of the favorite ones that I've ever gotten. That's Woody Raspberry for your reference. Okay, and the other scent I got is another banger. This is Ambry, mm, Ambry Orange Blossom, and it's inspired by Estee Lauder's perfume, Beautiful. And honestly, that's the perfect name for this because this Ambry Orange Blossom perfume is just that. It smells beautiful. Now, all of that is good and well, right? Like all of that sounds peachy keen, smelling good is living good, but one thing that's very important about Dossier to me and something that attracted me to the company in the first place is that they are a cruelty-free fragrance company. And most high-end perfumes are not cruelty-free. So if you love animals as much as I do, I know that that'll be like a selling point for you because that's very important to me. I don't feel like another living creature needs to be um, hurt for me to smell good, right? right? And on top of that, if that's not like one of your priorities when choosing products, right? Because it's not everybody's. Uh, a big, another, another big selling point is that these perfumes are a fraction of the price of high-end perfumes and they smell the same. So anyways, Dossier is offering members of the Brat Pack 10% off their new favorite perfume when they use the link in my description box and use the code Bratterstein10 at checkout. And these perfumes are already so affordable. So getting them at this price plus another 10% off, plus if you do like the bulk deal, then you get the free shipping and all that jazz. It's a deal that I think is too good to pass up, especially since it's about to be Christmas. Like imagine everybody that you love just getting like a new perfume. I think that's rad because how often are people going out and buying it for themselves? You know, it's one of those luxury things that you could provide for them. That's just my opinion. So if that all sounds good to you, make sure to click the link in my description box and use the code Bratterstein at checkout to let them know that I sent you and get a discount on your new favorite perfume today. And now I want to say one last thank you to Dossier for sponsoring today's video and making it possible for me to put out as many videos as I do as consistently as I do. And I thank you to you guys for always being so supportive of all of my sponsors. You rock don't ever change. All right, now that I'm done spreading the good word of dossier, we can go ahead and get into this video. Now, this is a video that was actually suggested to me by a subscriber, a member of the Brat Pack named Katie. Hi, Katie. Thank you, Katie. And this is a case from Katie's hometown. It's a case that's personal to her. I told you guys I wanted to start doing more hometown cases. And this is one from her area. This is one that is particularly close to her because Katie even went as far as participating in the searches for Mickey when she went missing. And Katie's brother even had his arm broken by the person who took Mickey's life. So there's a lot of connection here. This is a case that I had never heard of before. It took place in a small town in Nevada and Nevada, Nevada, 
I don't know why my brain wants to say Nevada recently. I guess I'm just feeling fancy, but this took place in a small town in Nevada. And I'm surprised that I had never heard of it because it's a horrific case. It's one of those cases where the word horrific almost loses meaning when talking about this case because what happened to Mickey is just so terrifying and so absolutely awful. And it seems to have happened for no reason. Like the real why, the why, like why did this happen still hasn't really been clarified. So the pointlessness of her murder weighs very heavy, at least on me. It's just one of those cases that once I heard about it, once I saw Mickey's face, once I started reading her story, I couldn't stop. I felt compelled to learn everything I could, and now I have read all of the things. So today I'm going to tell you all the information, give it to you in a concise story so that you don't have to go and, you know, read a million articles like I did. I did the work, so you do not have to. Now, at the end of this video, I want you to answer the question of the day. I want you to consider all the information I give you and then answer the question of the day. And that is this, what do you think was the motive for the murder of Mickey Costanzo? All right, now that I've said all those things that I need to say, come gather around and let me tell you the story of the senseless murder of 16 year old Michaela Mickey Costanzo. All right, guys, to get started today, we're going to jump in our handy dandy time machine and we're going to head to 2011 to West Wendover, Nevada. And it's a little town that's about 400 miles away from Las Vegas. It's a town that's described as, quote, a tiny town in Nevada that has a little bit of everything, end quote. And it's on the border of Utah and Nevada. It's a tiny little place with a population of about 5,000 people sitting in an area that is literally only seven and a half square miles. Like it's a very teeny tiny place that was actually, it's actually not was, is actually set in another time zone. Wendover is on mountain time instead of being on Pacific time like the rest of Nevada. I know the time zone doesn't particularly matter when it comes to this case, but something about it was just really, really interesting to me because I've never really heard of that. There being two different time zones in one state. I'm sure it happens more than, than my knowledge, but it just stuck out to me. So I thought I would mention it to you. But anyway, it was this place, West Wendover, that is the backdrop to a horrible crime. And it was on a cool day in March of 2011 when this man was on the edge of town and he was either going to work or coming home from work. It hardly matters, but either way he's driving and he sees some weird tire tracks that catch his attention because they're in an area where like there shouldn't be tire tracks. So he sees them and they kind of give him a pause. You know, he feels compelled for whatever reason to follow these tracks. So he does just that. He follows the tracks. And as he does that, he comes to a disturbed sage bush. Okay. And he's like, huh? And he lifts the sage bush. And when he does that, he sees what appears to be blood and disturbed earth. So he calls the police. Now, if you're anything like me, you're probably like, okay, so this guy is just driving along when all of a sudden he notices some unusual tire tracks follows them and then just happens to stumble upon an apparent crime scene. What's up? That sounds very suspicious. Yes, I know. But there was a little bit of a unique situation when it came to this man discovering this site. And that's because the entire town of West Wendover, it's just called Wendover. Why am I saying West Wendover? They were in West Wendover. Anyway, the entire town was on high alert because a 16 year old girl named Michaela Ray Costanzo had been missing and everybody had been searching everywhere for her. And this man had just stumbled upon her shallow grave. Michaela Ray Costanzo, who went by Mickey, so I'll probably be calling her Mickey through the entirety of this video, was born May 3rd, 1994. And she was the youngest of three daughters born to her mother, Celia, having two older sisters, one named Delicia, Delicia, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, D-A-L-I-C-I-A, -I -I -A, and she went by DJ, which will be much easier and what we will call her for this video, and another sister named Christina. Mickey's father's name was Theodore, and he went by Teddy, and Mickey also had three older half-sisters, I believe on her father's side, and they were named Jennifer, Kim, and Amy. Mickey's mother said that she was one of the lucky kids that was just born happy. She was always smiling, always super positive. She just walked through life a little differently and found the good in everything and everybody. Well, <laughs> I say walked through life differently, which is kind of ironic because I read that Mickey was one of those stubborn babies who like refused to try to learn how to walk. Like she was like, absolutely not. That sounds like 
bullshit. And I feel that so hard because my baby right now, he was supposed to like be rolling from his back to his belly about a month ago. And he just started doing it yesterday because every time I put him down, he's like, this is, this is nonsense. Pick me up and put me in my standing toy because I don't want to lay on my back right here. This is dumb. So I just felt that a little bit. Mickey's was just seen as like a good kid, right? She was good at school. She got good grades. She was good at writing. She would write short stories and poetry. And she was even working on writing a book. And she was also very active in extracurriculars, especially um, sports. She played basketball and she ran track. Michaela was in honor classes. Like she was super smart. And she was even the editor of her student newspaper. She was very mature beyond her years, like reliable, happy likable, like super popular, beautiful, and happy. She wasn't one of those angsty or depressed teenagers. Everyone knew her too, because again, this was a small town. And I mean, the school that she went to only even had like 300 kids. So basically everyone knew each other. So everyone knew Mickey. She was just seen as the kid who was doing the right thing, all the right things. She was seen as a parent's dream. Christina, her sister even said like out of all of the daughters, out of all of the girls, Mickey was the one who was doing the right thing. Mickey was the one going down the right path. She was bright and beautiful and smart and popular. She quote, had it all. And on top of all of that, she was also one of those kids who was super close with her family. She was super close with her mom and she was super close with her sisters, uh, DJ and Christina. They weren't even just like sisters. They were more like friends. Apparently Mickey and Christina, no, excuse me, Mickey and DJ were super, super close. Like they were considered um, best friends. They were seen as twins sometimes because they resembled each other and they were each other's shadow. Like they had all the same friends. And if one wasn't with the other, they'd be like, oh, where's your shadow? You know, it was like that kind of relationship, which is usually something that I see, or at least that I've experienced that happens when you're older, not generally when you are younger. So that is a bit of a unique and wonderful thing. And she was also super close with her, her eldest sister, Christina. Christina used to give her a ride home from school like every single day. Now, that brings us to the beginning of our story. It is a Thursday. It's March 3rd, 2011 on a cool winter afternoon. And Mickey has just finished track practice and is about to walk home. Now, generally her sister, Christina or Christina's husband would always give Mickey a ride home, but they weren't going to be in town right now. So Mickey decided that she would walk home. It was less than a mile. The mindset was, what could go wrong? Christina checked with her and was like, are you sure that you're okay, that you're going to have a way to get home, that everything's going to be fine. And Mickey was like, yeah, don't worry about me. I got it. I am good. Now, Mickey was a 16 year old junior in high school. And as I illustrated already in this video, she was not seen as a typical teenage girl. She was seen as an exceptional teenage girl, somebody who was very reliable. And she was particularly good at checking in with her mother. Um, basically, all day long, telling her everything she was doing and what she was going to be doing, where she was going, when she was going to be, where, ETC, ETC. Like she would give her mom a play by play of what she was doing. She'd be like, okay, I'm at practice. I'm done with practice. I'm changing. I'm heading home. Like she was very, very on top of letting her mom know what was going on. So on that day, Mickey's mom, Celia, was working at a local casino and she realized that Mickey hadn't texted her, hadn't let her know that she was on her way home, hadn't let her know that she had gotten home. And it was well after practice should have been over. The sun was already setting and she hadn't heard from Mickey at all. And this was weird immediately for the girl who communicates to the point that it's communicates to a fault is how her mother worded it um, to just all of a sudden not be communicating at all. That didn't sit right with her right away. Mickey hadn't contacted her mother when practice was over, when she was changing or when she was walking home. And this was completely out of character. So immediately her mom called her and the phone rang and rang and rang before going straight to, well, not straight to voicemail. That's not right. Rang and rang and rang before going to voicemail. And this too was very strange. This is a teenage girl. She's 16 years old. Her phone is glued to her hand. So why would she not answer it? So her mother calls again. And this time, it only rings one time before being sent to voicemail. Somebody had the phone and somebody sent her call to voicemail. So at this point, Mickey's mom's like, um, what the fuck? So she goes and she calls Mickey's older sister, Christina, the one who normally gave her a ride home. Christina was not in town. She was actually in Vegas, hundreds of miles away watching some like NASCAR races, I believe. But Celia's mindset was these two are very close. They talk all the time. Maybe she's heard from Mickey. Maybe she has some idea what's going on. So she calls Christina and Christina's like, okay, no, I haven't heard from her, but don't panic. Maybe track ran late. Maybe she got busy doing something. I'm sure 
that everything is fine. Don't worry about it. And the two got off the phone and then she too immediately called Mickey to see if maybe she'd answer for her. But again, the phone was not answered. Mama in a panic leaves work early. She knows that something is wrong. This doesn't feel right. Something is just not quite right. She, her mom instincts are a go and it's dark outside. There's no way she wouldn't have heard from her and there's no way practice would be going on this late. But despite that, she does drive to the school. The very first place she goes, she drives to the school to see if maybe she is still there. But when she gets there, she finds that the school's totally empty. There's nobody there. Track practice has not run late into the night, which wouldn't have made sense anyway. So she's like, okay, and she heads for home. And the whole drive home, she just watches out her window and watches for her, hoping that she'll just see her walking down the road and have some sort of explanation, but she doesn't. She gets all the way home and she doesn't see Mickey. So she hopes that she'll walk inside the house and Mickey will just be there with some sort of, you know, BS teenage excuse as to why she didn't have her phone, why her phone had died, why she wasn't answering. But when she got home, Mickey wasn't there either. Inside the house, it was only Mickey's sister, DJ. So her mom asks DJ at this point, like, where is Mickey? And at this point she's a little bit frantic and she's like, you know what, this isn't funny. Like, where is Mickey? And DJ's like, I'm just sitting here doing my thing. I have no idea where Mickey is, but she can tell that this is serious. So she immediately goes out and she starts looking for Mickey. And it's dark by this point and it's cold, man. I don't know if you've ever lived in the desert or been to the desert. Desert nights are cold as fuck. And Mickey's out there without a jacket. It just doesn't make any sense. So she goes around, she looks, she doesn't find her. She calls all of Mickey's friends. She calls all of her friends and nobody has heard from her. At this point, they're like, okay, we need to go. We need to alert the authorities. So they go and they report Mickey missing. But by the time they had reported her missing, the word had already gotten out that she was missing from the family making phone calls and things like that. So like a hundred people had already gotten together and started searching for her before the police even did. The entire community of Wendover was in shock because again, this was a small town. This was the type of place where things like this just did not happen. So when Mickey's family is talking to the cops and telling them what happened and telling them that she's missing, like when they go to report her missing, the cops tell them like, well, did you talk to her friends? Have you gone to places she frequents? Have you done this? Have you done that? And they're like, yes, bro, we've done our due diligence. Now we're here to talk to you and we need you to go out and find her. We need you to go and just go. And the cop even asked Mickey's mom, Celia, like, what is your gut? What is your gut instinct telling you? And she said that she believed that something had happened to her baby. But of course, as we sometimes see in these cases, the cops didn't take it super seriously at first. They told Mickey's family, like not to worry that they were sure that she would show up at school the next day to go home and to just relax. And Mickey's mom was like, no, you don't understand. Like something is wrong. She's not going to show up at school tomorrow because something has happened. She did not go away on her own. And of course she was right. Um, the next day came, it was Friday and Mickey did not show up at school. And this is when it really like was hammered home for her mom that like Mickey probably wasn't coming home because this didn't make any sense. She, she could just feel it. She knew something was, she, I think she knew, I think she was one of those people that just knew her daughter was gone. I could be wrong. Obviously I don't know her, but it's just the vibe I get from listening to her talk. Like some people are like, I knew they were out there. I knew they were out there. I don't get that vibe from her. I feel like she just knew. And she said that it made her feel like a failure. She felt like a failure, not only for not being able to protect Mickey, but also for not being able to like help her daughter DJ because she was having a really hard time with the fact that her sister was missing and she couldn't do anything to make it better for her. DJ went from upset and scared to also just mad calling Mickey over and over and telling her like, this isn't funny. You need to come home. Like what? fuck. And it's just so sad. And then as for Christina, her older sister, she had been away all the way in Vegas and couldn't really do anything. You know, she had been telling herself like nothing was wrong. Maybe her sister was just out finally like fucking around and being a normal rebellious teenager, even though that would be totally out of character for her. But now she realized that something was seriously wrong. And she asked her husband, like, let's go. We need to go back. And they made the hours long drive back from Vegas to Wendover. Pretty soon after Mickey didn't show up at school the following morning. Police, the small police station in Wendover really started looking for her. They went and they searched her school. They searched her house. They searched all the surrounding areas, but they didn't find anything. And they quickly found that they didn't have any clues. They didn't have any eyewitnesses. They didn't really have any suspects. So they didn't have anywhere to start. They weren't convinced that it was foul play right from the beginning. And they weren't even convinced that she had been in trouble or that she may be dead. They were really holding out hope, like really, really holding out hope that she was just being a rebellious teenager and that she would show back up at home with some crazy story about where she had been and what she had been doing and apologize and everything would be just fine. 
Mickey was described as being five foot five inches tall, weighing 105 pounds with brown hair and brown eyes. And she was said to have last been seen wearing blue jeans with a dark colored sweatshirt um, with a light colored shirt under it and white tennis shoes. And police say that Mickey was also seen carrying a black backpack with white hearts. Now, even though police were holding out hope that she would just show back up and everything would be fine, in the meantime, they were still trying to talk to everyone who knew her, talk to her friends, see if they could figure out where she might have gone and who with or what might have happened. Because even if she did leave voluntarily, she might have told somebody. So they did just that. They interviewed everyone who knew her. They interviewed all of her friends. And in doing so, they found out that Mickey had a boyfriend, a teenage boy, teenage boy who was a friend, a boyfriend. Yes. And his name was Javier. Javier and Mickey met in track and they hit it off quickly. They were seen as being super cute and super sweet together, but he was also said to be a bit, a bit jealous or that he had at least a jealous moment with Mickey. Apparently Mickey had this guy, best friend, his name was Cody. And in one instance, Javier and Mickey had been together in the hallway and Cody had come over and grabbed her, threw her over his shoulder and was like holding her up on his shoulder. And, you know, you've seen it. I can picture it in my head. I can picture the school. They're in the hallway, lockers. He's got her, ha ha ha, hilarious. Javier is like, well, this is a little bit weird. And it made him uncomfortable. And Mickey didn't understand why. She didn't understand why he would think it was weird because this was just like her guy, best friend. But his feelings might've been a little bit justified. Um, one, he's a teenager and teenagers are jealous jealous things. They're learning how to be people. But even if he wasn't a teenager, this is the type of thing that could make a person jealous because Mickey and Cody actually briefly dated and it didn't work out. They broke up. Apparently like he was like unfaithful to her and they broke up. It didn't work out, but they had remained friends. So Mickey didn't see why it was such a big deal because they were just friends and Cody had gone on and had like a fiance now and she was with Javier. So what was the big deal? Police obviously want to look into Javier, right? Because he is the boyfriend and statistically it is a significant other who was involved when a woman is murdered or disappears. So they go and they bring him in to be interviewed. And dude, this kid is an actual baby. Like his face, he's like a, he's just like a little cherub. He's so like precious and small and young. Well, he was then. It was many years ago now. Now he's a full on adult. But back then he was just a little baby goat. He tells police that he and Mickey had been dating for about a year and a half. And the police ask him like, okay, well, was anything going on with her? Was anything weird with her? Did you know anything that was going on that could have been upsetting her? Like, why would she go? And he said that, no, she seemed fine. She seemed perfectly normal. Nothing was standing out to him. And he said that she was the type of person who wore her emotions like on her sleeve. She wasn't the type of person to hide that at all. So if something had been wrong with her and she was planning on like going somewhere, he really believes that he would have known it or she would have told him. And Javier also told them the last time he saw Mickey was at lunch. He says that the two had their lunch together as boyfriend and girlfriend do. And then they walked down the hall together to their class and they said their goodbyes and they went to their respective classes. And that was the last time he saw her. But that's not what Mickey's best friend Cody said in his interview. When Cody was brought in for questioning when Mickey went missing, he came in, he was super exhausted because he had been out the night before, like many people looking for Mickey, because again, his best friend is missing. And he tells police, like they ask him, like, when's the last time you saw Mickey? And he says that he saw her after track practice, which is well after lunch. And he said that he had seen her with a boy, a young man who he believed to be her boyfriend. And this was Javier. He specifically said that he saw her standing out in front of the school, like leaving through the front door, standing in the front with the quote, Mexican kid, which rubbed me the wrong way. I'm not going to lie. Like I was like, sir, that's a bit rude. Like, I don't know. Just referring to somebody that way makes me raise my eyebrow at you a little bit, but that's what he said. But he was referring to Javier. Now that's not what Javier said, right? Javier said he saw her at lunch, not right after track practice, which is right before she went missing. Police also asked him, like they're questioning him. So they ask him for his alibi because they have to check him off the list as well. Um, they're not just going to take his word for it that Mickey was with Javier. You know what I mean? They're, they're doing their due diligence. So they ask him where he was. And he says that after school that day, the day that Mickey, Mickey went missing, he went and he picked up his fiance that his fiance had been like at some meeting at a clubhouse with her parents. And then he went and picked her up there at about five and they were together until seven and police went and they confirmed with his fiance that they were together. Um, so they checked Cody off that list. 
But anyways, moving on. That doesn't look good, right? You don't like to see that there are inconsistencies with people's stories and inconsistencies on who Mickey might have last been seen with and who she might have last been with. It's kind of sketchy. So they're like, okay, we need to look into these alibis, see where people were, all of that jazz. So police are doing just that. They're looking into alibis. They're following all the leads. They're investigating as police do in these situations. And in the meantime, her poor family just have to sit and wait. The police told Celia like to stay home, wait, wait by the door, wait by the phone, wait and see if Mickey comes home, wait and see if Mickey calls, wait for us to call you, just, just wait essentially. And she said she did just that. She went home and she just sat and she waited and she stared at the door knowing that Mickey wasn't gonna walk through that door. So Christina, you remember Mickey's sister, she had driven all the way back home from Vegas. And as soon as she got back into town, she went to her mom's house. And, you know, I can only imagine what that was like. Very emotional. I'm sure there were a lot of tears. And she told her mom right away, like, she's like, I'm going to go out and I'm going to look for Mickey. She, she said that she knew that she wasn't going to find her the way that they wanted. She knew in her gut that she wasn't going to find her alive, but she felt like she needed to go out and look. She said she felt in her like bones that she needed to go out and look and that she was destined to be the one who found Mickey. So she did just that. She went out and she searched. She searched all over the isolated and abandoned areas all over town. She searched through the deserts. She went and looked at every single like dirt mound that looked suspicious or any place that looked like it could have recently been dug up. And she ended up finding herself at a place called the gravel pits, having no idea just how close she was to actually being the one to find Mickey. Of course, Christina wasn't the only person out looking for Mickey. That was just on that night um, that she ended up so close to where she would be found. But police were out there searching. Volunteers were out there searching. People were outside, outside, alongside police and Mickey's family. And at one point, um, Mickey's sister DJ just like lost it out there. She like dropped to her knees and she was like, we're, we're not going to find her out here. And she was told like, you know, you have to keep your head up. You have to have hope. And her sister's like, what hope? Like what if she's, listen, <laughs> if she's alive out there, then where is she? Right? What am I having hope for? Oh, it just makes me so sad. I think about that. And I'm just like, damn, I can't imagine what that feels like. I really can't. I can't. The local media even covered this case pretty extensively um, in that area. Local media. Got it. Cool. And everybody was echoing the same thing that they just, they were hopeful that she would come home. They were hopeful that she would be found safe because I think it was just too difficult for anyone to consider the alternative. But then the alternative, just a few days after Mickey went missing, that man who was either heading to work or heading home from work discovered those unusual tire tracks and followed them to the gravel pits, the same gravel pits where Mickey's sister, Christina had just been searching for her sister. He went, he saw the sage bush, he saw the blood, he called the police. So local police went out and they brought a camera with them so that they could record anything that they found. They weren't really expecting to find a body, um, but they wanted to just record whatever it was just so everything could be on the record. So they go and they see the sage bush and they see the blood. So they start lightly digging just to kind of see what they could come across. And they quickly come across a human body. And they said like, they really didn't think that they, that's what they were going to find. Yeah. Blood might seem suspicious, but they said people go out all the time and they like bury dogs and shit like that. So they really were not expecting to be finding Mickey out there on that day. It was at this point that they realized that this was out of their expertise. This small police station just did not have the resources to properly preserve the crime scene. So they called in um, crime scene investigators from Reno to come and exhume the area properly to ensure that all evidence was recovered correctly. But Reno, man, that was a nine hour drive. So somebody had to drive all of that way in order to do this. So in the meantime, Local police just had to wait. They cordoned off the area and they were watching it to make sure nothing happened. Nobody went there, but they couldn't do anything. And I guess like, while they were there, like guarding the scene until somebody from Reno could get there to properly process it. Mickey's sister, Christina drove by and she recognized the area because she had just been there looking. Um, and she saw a unmarked police car and saw that it was being cordoned off. And she said that she just knew her heart sunk and she drove straight to her mom's house and she picked her mom up so that they could drive to speak to the chief of police and find out what the fuck was going on. So they go and they speak to him and he tells them that a body has been found and that the searches for Mickey are called off and her sister kind of loses it. And it's like, 
well, did you see her? Do you know it's her? Like, why are you calling off the searches? Did you see her? Like, are, have you confirmed that it's her? And he's like, no, no, I didn't. I didn't see her myself yet. We haven't completely recovered her yet. And she's like, then why are you stopping the searches? Like, it might not be her. And he was like, listen, like, nobody else is missing. I can't, I can't even imagine. Can you imagine being in his situation and knowing how upset they are and how hopeful they are that this isn't what it is, but you knowing deep down that it is, it's just like, oh my God, my heart. Now, one of the things that's really sad here is the forensics team was coming from Reno, right? So they weren't going to be there until like the next morning and her poor family had like learned this and was like, you guys are really like, you guys are really going to leave her out there all night like alone in the dark, in the ground all night. And the police chief was like, listen, like she's not going to be alone. We're going to be there with her the whole time. We can't do anything. We need the scene to be good, but she's not going to be alone. But this was still like super hard for her family. They were like, oh, sure. That's great that she's not going to be alone, but she's still going to be out there in the cold. And they felt like they should have been the ones that were there with her. The following day, the police did release a press conference saying that a body had been found in a shallow grave, but they didn't specify that it was Mickey that was found in the shallow grave. Now for the record, cause some of you might still be thinking that the initial man that found Mickey was like suspicious, right? Because the thing is, is he wasn't even part of the search party. He had just been like out either at work, coming home or going to work. I believe he was coming home from work. Cause that makes a lot more sense to me, but either way, he wasn't part of the search party. So they thought it was weird that he happened to be the one who found her, that he just happened to find these tire tracks and just happened to like follow them. Right. So he was looked into. And when they questioned him about it, they were like, yo, like really you just happened upon the situation that seems real shady. And he said that like he had heard about Mickey, he had heard about what happened and he just felt so bad that he felt compelled to search for her and that I guess it was just luck and it turned out like he he really had nothing to do with it and it was just one of those situations where it seemed weird but it was just coincidence anyways I don't know why I even felt the need to tell you that but I did because it's one of those things that I feel like sometimes people do question those like they are suspicious of those who randomly come upon bodies like the man who found Kaylee Anthony and the man who found Heyman Lee like people are always like hmm did they have something to do with it this person, police thought the same thing, but it turns out he had nothing to do with it. But anyways, um, back to finding Mickey. So there was a jurisdictional issue when it came to where her body was found because she was technically outside the city limits because it was like on the edge of town and she was technically outside the city limits. So this would put it in the sheriff's department's jurisdiction, but the sheriff's department was like a hundred miles away. So it took some time, but eventually a detective from the sheriff's department came down, the crime scene techs from Reno came down and they were able to unearth the body. And once they did, they were able to confirm that it was 16 year old Mickey Costanzo. I guess they were able to tell just visually that it was her, but they were able to like officially confirm it. It was Mickey and she was buried just five miles away from home. Mickey had been brutalized. She had been bound by zip ties. She had been beaten, cut. She had numerous slash marks across her face, her neck and her head. And all of this was before she had been stabbed to death. Her main cause of death being a large cut to her throat. And the whole thing seemed to be aggressive, not precise, but personal. And this was confusing because this was like a happy, well, like popular 16 year old girl. So who personally had such an ax to grind with her that they would just destroy her in this way. Once it was confirmed that it was Mickey's body, they went and they informed her family that she was dead. And I guess it was a horrific, um, scene, a horrific telling. I can't imagine how it would feel to, I really should put, I can't imagine on a t-shirt because apparently I have no other words in my vocabulary um, ever, but I guess DJ just was destroyed. She like screamed and crumpled to the floor. And her mom said that like, she still remembers DJ scream to this day and that DJ was doing exactly what she wanted to do. She wanted to scream. She wanted to fall apart and fall to the ground, but she couldn't, she had to stay strong because she was the mom. And this woman, man, I feel like she is just such a good person. And it really kind of gives you an idea as to why Mickey was so great because in every interview, every single telling everything I saw from her, she's always focusing on her daughters. Like everything is about them and their pain and how they're dealing with losing Mickey and how it's affecting them. And she very seldomly talks about herself, even though, you know, it's destroying her. It's all about what she can do to help her daughters and what she couldn't do and how she feels bad about not being able to help them. And I'm just like, that is a mom. You know what I mean? Like that is a 
mom right there. And this mom, the next time she saw her daughter was in a body bag. They did, and it wasn't even like she saw her, she saw her, she saw her shape through the body bag. They wouldn't open it for her. Um, they, they were like, listen, it's her. You don't need to see her, which is probably the right move considering how brutalized she had been. It probably wouldn't have been good for her to see her at that time, but she just broke down and she cried and she like laid there and she held the body bag and she cried and told Mickey that she loved her and that she was sorry. And then they took her away from her again. They wheeled her away from her mother again this time to go and perform her autopsy. Following the discovery of Mickey's body, her mother made a tearful plea to the public saying, and I quote, please ladies and gentlemen, this is not over yet until the person or persons responsible are brought to justice. Mickey's funeral was a huge service. It ended up getting to be so large that they had to rent out a thousand seat concert hall just to accommodate the number of people who wanted to come and say goodbye and pay their respects. And it was said that Mickey was like everyone's daughter, which I get it. It also, it does ring weird in my ear because like she wasn't your daughter. She was Celia's daughter. She's the one who really lost her. But what they meant when they said this is that she was like the town's daughter and that everybody was greatly affected um, and mourned her loss. At Mickey's funeral, her teachers talked, her coaches talked, everybody talked about how great she was, how she had an infectious smile that can make anyone's day better. And they said that she was the like go-to girl and a natural leader and just an amazing person. Mickey's school was so affected that on the Saturday after she was found, the school officials actually opened up the high school for the staff and the students to gather. And the students created little memorials with flowers and candles for Mickey. And the school offered, um, they announced that they were going to be offering the Mickey Spirit of Friendship Award and scholarship in her honor. And the high school counselor, a woman named Anne, said of Mickey's death, and I quote, It's very solemn. There's lots of tears and there's lots of people that are very scared or nervous. So Mickey was found now, but there still weren't any suspects. There weren't any main people of interest. They had nothing. This girl had no enemies. She was just a nice, popular, well-liked girl. Like how many times can I say that? And that's how police felt too. They're like, how, like what? There's nobody. Who did it? Nobody. Like what are we supposed to do here? Um, but it wasn't a total loss. They did. They were able to uncover a couple of things that they found useful. So they searched the scene first and they didn't find any hair fibers or fingerprints, nothing like that. But they did find two pieces of evidence that would prove to be useful in pointing them in the direction of a suspect, finally. First, number one, they were able to find Mickey's cell phone and they thought, hey, this might be useful because she's a teenage girl. She has her phone glued to her hand. Maybe she was talking to somebody. Maybe there's a text message, something like that that could lead us in the right direction. And when they looked into her cell phone records, they found that she had been talking to one person quite a bit. In addition to that, police were able to get the surveillance footage from the school from the day that Mickey disappeared. And they thought this could be especially useful because remember Mickey had zip ties on her wrists. Police were thinking that this was because she was abducted and they thought it was very likely that she could have been abducted from the school. So they watched the footage and that's when they see Mickey and they see her walking down the hall, headed towards the back of the school after track practice. And then they see somebody else there, somebody walking behind her, seemingly following her out of the back of the school. This person following her just happens to be the exact same person who Mickey had been talking to a bunch on her phone right before she went missing. Now, any guesses on who this may have been? Go ahead and pause the video real quick. Leave your answer down in the comment section below. I will wait. Don't cheat. Don't wait for me to say it. Don't listen for me to say it and then go back and leave the comment because I will know and I'm not your real mom, but I would appreciate your honesty. So go ahead and leave your guesses down below. Okay, did you do it? Okay, cool. It was her best friend of years, her puppy love, Cody Cree Patton. Now, who was Cody? Cody was a senior at the same high school Mickey went to, a big, real tall, 170 pound football player and one of Mickey's oldest friends. The two had grown up together and she and Cody had a sort of puppy love is how her family described it. Mickey had dated Cody for a short period, but it didn't last very long because, well, one, she wasn't supposed to be dating, but I guess that was a little bit of a secret. And two, Cho Chody, no, Cody cheated on her. 
So it ended and Mickey was pretty hurt by the whole thing, but the two remained friends and moved on. The two had been friends forever and were very close. So Mickey's family was very familiar with Cody. Cody had even lived in the same apartment complex as Mickey and her family. I guess his parents were the managers of the apartment complex. And so he had been around a lot. He had shared meals with them. You know, they were very close. Um, but since then he had moved, he had actually met a new little girly, um, and gotten engaged. This was a girl named Tony Frado and the two had gotten engaged and he was now living with her and her family for two reasons. One, because they were engaged, so they want to live together. And two, he started um, getting into some trouble, messing up at school, and his parents kicked him out of the house. So he's like, okay, fine, I'm gonna go move in with Tony. So that's Cody. And for the record, because remember Cody said that she was last seen with Javier because he was trying to like throw them off his trail. I just thought I'd let you know that the police did look into Javier's alibi. He had told them that he had left school and went and picked up his little brother, I believe, and then went to his after school job because he had a job because he was responsible. And they looked into it and all of that was proven to be true. So he had a strong alibi for when Mickey went missing. Now, back to the surveillance video. So what they're seeing on this video is not what Cody said, right? He tried to make it seem like she was one at the front of the school, not at the back of the school, and that she was with Javier, not with him. But now they're watching and they're like, she's walking to the back of the school and you are following her. And then she went missing. So what the fuck? So they decide they want to speak to Mickey's mom because again, they knew that Cody and her were very close. They had grown up together um, and that Mickey's mom was very familiar with him. So she, they wanted to speak to her and kind of find out who he was, what she thought about him, things like that. Kind of get, get some more information on who he was as a person. Celia told police that Cody was an interesting person, that he was the type of kid who could be the literal biggest sweetheart in the world. But at the same time, he could turn on a dime and he had a really bad temper. Police bring Cody in for questioning and he comes in with his dad because he's underage. Wait, is he underage? No, I don't think he actually was underage, but he's accompanied by his father regardless. And just to look at him, police didn't get a bad vibe. He was, he had a look to him that didn't look suspicious. He was tall, clean cut, seemed like a good kid. He was respectful. He told police the same story he had the first time that he wasn't with Mickey, that he had left and he'd been with Tony and blah, blah, blah. And when he was questioned about like the text messages and why he had been blowing up Mickey's phone so much, he basically said that he needed to move some car parts and that Mickey was like his best friend. So he, she was his go-to girl. So he wanted her help with doing that. It turns out though, later we find out from a friend of Mickey's that the texts that Cody had been sending to her were like weird cryptic things, him telling her that he wanted to do a project with her, but wouldn't say what the project was and wouldn't give her any more information. And Mickey had confided in a friend that these were very unusual texts to her. So please press him a little bit on the text messages and also on the fact that you're saying that you last saw her, you're sticking to your story that you saw her leaving through the front of the school and that she was with um, Javier, but other people and also the cameras are showing that she went to the back of the school and that you were following her. And they also were like, the text message thing sounds like bullshit also. So they press him. And this is when he says that, okay, the real reason they had been texting so much is that Mickey wanted to get back with him and they were talking about them. And then he says that Mickey asked him for a ride home um, so that they could also talk about them because she didn't have one and that he had agreed and he had driven her home, dropped her off and hadn't seen her since. At this point, police are like, hell yeah, we got him to admit that she was in the truck. We've got his back against the wall. So at this point they're like, hey, they lied to him. They're, they're allowed to do that. They're like, hey, we tested the dirt on the truck that you borrowed because it wasn't his truck. We'll get into that later. But we tested the dirt on the truck that you were driving and it matches the dirt found at the gravel pit. So what's up with that? If you drove her home, why does your truck have dirt on it that was also found where she was murdered? And this is where he panics and he now changes the story again and admits that he had gone out to the gravel pits with her, that they wanted to go and be alone to talk about them because earlier in the day, Mickey had told him that he, that she was still in love with him and that they wanted to talk about that. So at this point, police are like, oh, we got this mother Okay, like we got him. So they're like, listen, we know you're involved. We saw her walking. We saw that you were waiting for her. And this is when she went missing. And this is when she died. And we know that you did it. And he denied it, obviously, but he sounded really freaked out. And it was at about the four hour mark that Cody started to break. He was adamant no matter what was said that he did not kill her. But the interview was clearly getting to him. And it was at this point that he asked for a break. He said he wanted to um, be with his father 
for a little bit. He said he needed a breather and he wanted to tell his father the truth. Now, once his father and him were together in that room, it's not known what was said because it wasn't recorded. Why? I don't know. I really don't, especially because I think they were left in an interrogation room. I don't know why it wouldn't be recorded, but it wasn't. But from outside the door, the officers could hear what sounded like a heated conversation between the two, followed by what they describe as Cody's father wailing. So police go back in and they see Cody and his father and his father, who looks like he's just had his world totally shattered, tells Cody like, okay, be a man, tell them what you did. And at this point he waves his Miranda rights and he says that he's going to tell them the truth. Maybe the truth. Cody's father said to him through tears. And I quote, you've got to start fixing this now as much as you can. What you did is heinous, Cody. I don't want to abandon you at all. Okay. You gotta do what's right. It's at this point that Cody makes a confession. He tells his father and he tells police the truth about what happened. Well, his first version of the truth of what happened to Mickey. He told them that he had picked up Mickey to give her a ride home since her sister was out of town. And while the two were driving, Mickey dropped a bombshell on him that she still loved him, that he needed to break up with Tony, his fiance, and to be with her. And he says that he told her no. And that at this point she got very upset. She started to fight with him. She started to hit him while he was driving and they happened to be by the gravel pit. So he pulled over and the two got out and they started to argue. He said that she started to push him and pound on his chest. So he started just kind of pushing her off, off, pushing her off. And he says that at one point she hit him real good, one good swing on the side of his head and that it really hurt him. And in response, he gave her one big shove. And when he shoved her, she fell back and she hit her head into the bumper of the car. He says when she fell, she hit her head and then she just laid on the ground and kind of stared up at the sky blank and that her eyes then went dark. But he says at that point that she started to uh, seize. She started shaking and seizing and that she wouldn't stop and she was making noise. And he went over and he checked her pulse, but he couldn't find one, but that she was still shaking and he didn't know what to do and he panicked. So he says that he went to the vehicle he was driving and he grabbed a shovel and proceeded to hit her in the head, hoping that it would knock her unconscious, but it didn't, but it did mess her up pretty bad. He said at this point she was making a lot of sounds. He described them as gurgling sounds and he just wanted her to stop and not knowing any other way to make her stop. He took the shovel and took the sharp end of the shovel and stuck it into her throat to make the sound stop. Now, why did he have the shovel? He said he was using it to move the car parts, which I have to be honest, makes absolutely no sense to me. Let me know if you move car parts and you need to use a shovel to do so. But that's what he said all while telling police as he's crying, he's hysterical and he's making himself sick um, through the, I guess, emotional turmoil of reliving this event. He said that he then put her in that grave under the bush and then went and burned some items that had been theirs um, near the gravel pit. When asked why she had zip ties on her wrists, he says that he had put them on her wrists so that he could then try to take her to the dump, but he had already stabbed her in the throat with a shovel at this point and killed her. So why would he need the zip ties if she wasn't fighting him off? You know what I mean? Like it didn't make sense. So that was brought up to him. And he said he was trying to make it look like she had been kidnapped by somebody else to kind of throw investigators off if she had ever been recovered. So Cody was arrested and all the students at the tight knit high school she attended were devastated by the announcement, like the entire school, all the students and even the staff took the news very hard because they were an extremely tight knit group. And the vice principal said that everyone there was just emotionally spent from the whole ordeal. A lot of people wanted the death penalty for Cody, obviously, because of what he did. Um, and he was over the eight, over the 18. Yep. Yeah over the age of 18 at the time. So the likelihood of him getting it was kind of high, especially because of how brutal the murder was. But not everybody was sure this was the right move. And some of the people that weren't sure this was the right move was even members of Mickey's family. They just really had trouble believing that it was Cody. He was a good kid from a good family. He had always been such a good friend to Mickey. They knew him. They trusted him. So they had trouble believing that he could do something like this. They believed that if he had done it, he must have been 
told to do it by somebody else, like convinced to do it. Like they believed there had to be more to the story. Basically they weren't believing what he was saying happened because they didn't think it made sense at all. And on top of not believing his story about like what happened at the scene, like where she was killed. They also didn't believe the story about Mickey wanting to get back with Cody in the first place. Like she had her own boyfriend. Now she had Javier. They were happy. They were chilling, not killing. And on top of that, she knew that Cody was with Tony and she had been super respectful of that. She knew that like it would make Tony uncomfortable if they were together a lot because they had dated before. So she was actually keeping her distance away from Cody to be respectful to his fiance. Tony and Cody seemed pretty serious. Like Cody had even converted to Tony's religion, Mormonism. And Tony was planning on being with Cody and by his side when he entered the Marines. And she was even helping him improve in school so he could go and follow that dream to be in the Marines. So Mickey, knowing this, knowing how serious they were, they were engaged for God's sakes. They weren't just dating. She was like, okay, cool. I'm just going to keep my distance, keep a little space between us because I don't want to make anyone jealous. I mean, look at how jealous Javier got when me and Cody were being friendly, right? I don't need that drama, essentially. And clearly these two were very serious, Cody and Tony. I mean, because even after he got arrested, she was still like right by his side. I mean, as right by his side as one could be while he is in jail. She would drive the four hours to visit him, write him love letters, tell him she loved him and would be with him and only him. And they'd talk on the phone um, due to this collect calling plan her father had purchased for her. It had to look to those on the outside like she was in denial um, of what he had done. In denial of what he had done? Sure, that sounds right. Um, because otherwise, why would she be going and visiting him, right? And nobody could understand how this happened. Not Tony, not Mickey's family, not Cody's family, not even Tony's family could understand. Like they had come to love him as their own son. He lived with them. You know what I mean? Like he was part of their family. And they would ask him like, how could you do this? why did you do this? What happened? And he would just say like, I can't tell you. I'm not allowed to tell you. My lawyer told me I have to stop talking. Tony's father, Claude said of Cody. No. Yes. Tony's father, Claude said of Cody, Tony and Cody, that messes me up at this time. And I quote, we thought Cody was really trying to put his life in order. He always had a lot of problems. The side of Cody, which we knew is completely different than the Cody we know now. The feeling that there was more to the story was shared by many. Even the police felt this way because a retired secret service agent ended up being hired to look into Cody, look into the details of the murder and look into his confession. And when he looked into it first, he was like, okay, the wounds, the cuts to her face, everything about this doesn't say accident. It doesn't say got knocked into the bumper of a car. It doesn't say like a panic situation. It says intent and it says rage. So his story that already didn't sound believable was clearly bullshit. This investigator and in trying to learn more about Cody decided he wanted to speak to Cody's fiance, Tony, which makes sense, obviously, like who else would you talk to, but somebody who's going to marry the man. And she had already been spoke to before, because remember everybody who knew Mickey, your friends with Mickey, went to school with Mickey was questioned. And she was one of those people who were questioned, but this guy wanted to talk to her again, right? To get his own take on the situation essentially. She told this investigator that like she had no idea why Cody did what he did. And the investigator found her interview to be weird, not in like what she said, but how she said things. He said that she was quote, deadpan and emotionless, end quote. And he found this odd. But then again, her fiance was in jail for murder. So one would be a bit odd in that situation. I can only imagine. I can only imagine. Put it on a t-shirt. Come to find out though, the investigator wasn't the only one who noticed that Tony was acting a little bit different than one would expect her to act given the situation. Um, Mickey's sister DJ said that after Mickey was killed and after Cody was arrested for it, Tony wouldn't even look her in the eye. Like she completely avoided her gaze, but she just chalked it up to the fact that she was engaged to the man who was in jail for murdering her sister. Anyways, during the time that Cody was in jail awaiting trial about two months after the murder um, in May, uh, Mickey's family and her friends got together to celebrate um, what would have been Mickey's 17th birthday. And they celebrated at the school at the track where she had won so many races. Her family brought cake and balloons and met up with Mickey's friends and they all just got together and celebrated her and remembered her. And her mother said that this was the second hardest day of her life. Um, second only to learning that she had been murdered. Now Cody is sitting in jail with that ridiculous story. 
and it's not looking good, right? He's up for the death penalty. There are no other suspects. There's no evidence that anybody else was involved and he has admitted to doing it. And even though the, the evidence of the scene doesn't quite line up with what he said happened, it is clear that he was there and that he did take part in her murder, right? Cool. Well, this case blew wide open when Cody's attorneys, the defense team, received a visitor. A visitor came into their office with a useful tip. Well, not really a tip, more of a confession. This was Tony Frado, Cody's fiance. Tony had been driven into Cody's attorney's office by Cody's father, and she sat there looking hollow, blank, in her pajamas, and she told Cody's attorneys that she needed to tell them the truth about what really happened to Mickey. And I am so sorry, but that is where I'm going to leave you today. I hate to leave you on a cliffhanger, but there is so much information in this case that there was no way I could get it all in one video without it being like two hours long. And I know that that's not an easy watch for all people. So I wanted to make it a little bit more digestible. Don't worry though, it will be up next Monday. I'm not gonna make you wait forever to, to watch it or anything like that. You guys know I upload really consistently. So it will be up next Monday um, and it's only gonna be two parts. So you'll get the whole rest of the story in just one week. And man, when you hear the continuous different stories about what happened and what happens with the trials and pleas and things like that, this case is fucked, bro. But now, considering what I've told you so far, your gut reaction, I want you to revisit the question of the day. And that is this. So far, what do you think was the motive for the murder of Mickey Costanzo? But anyways, guys, that completes this video. I hope you found it interesting and informative, and I hope it gave you all the information you would want so far when looking into this case. And of course, I want to thank you for remembering Mickey with me today. Before you go, please don't forget to let me know down below of any cases you'd like to see me cover in the future. As this one indicates, if you leave me a suggestion with a case you want me to cover, I will put it on my list so I can try to look into it. And if I do, I want to be able to give you a shout out for giving me the suggestion, right? I love looking into the cases you suggest, especially hometown cases, because I know you're filled with good ideas and good taste. Otherwise, you would not be here. If you haven't already, please don't forget to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing the bell. I put out a new video every week and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically you. And if you want to hang out more consistently, all my social media is listed down below along with a link to my merch store. This isn't my merch. This is Kendall Ray's merch. You should buy this merch if you haven't already. All of the money um, from the proceeds of this shirt and a sweatshirt, I believe, go to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. So it's a good cause and a good t-shirt. So you should do that. And also down below will be a link to my membership. If you want to join, you get early access to non-sponsored videos, polls, live streams, things like that. I want to say one more thank you to Dossier for sponsoring today's video and making it possible for me to put out videos as consistently as I do. And I want to say thank you to you guys for always being so supportive of all my sponsors. You rock. Don't ever change. And with all of that said, I just want to thank you for being here when you could literally be anywhere else in the world. That is tight you are tight. Please stay safe and be a better person than you were yesterday. At the very least, be better than Cody Patton. And I hope to see you in my next video, Monday's video, which is part two to this video. Okay, bye.